Hello everyone and thank you for joining us in another round of AGC webinars. My name is Suzana Yeti and I'm the AGC Portfolio Marketing Manager and your moderator for today. Over the next 30 minutes you will get a chance to learn why the new standard for occupational health and safety ISO 45001 hasn't been published yet or how it will help you enhance your incomes when you implement it and why you actually don't need to wait for, the, for it to get published if you want to get certified right now. To tell us more about it, joining us is one of the global experts on occupational health and safety, Mr. Stephen Osbury. With an experience of 30 years in safety and risk management, he has written five books and uh, more than 40 technical paper, journal articles and conference papers on these topics. I would like to remind you that if you have any questions and comments during the presentation, feel free to write them in the question box in the control panel. Now, without further ado, I would like to turn the time over to our presenter. Mr. Osbury, you may start the presentation. Hello, everyone, and good afternoon. I'm Stephen Asprey, and I'm speaking to you from the Midlands of the United Kingdom. We have an excellent audience today, and I'd like to welcome you all to our session. Um, we have four main objectives today, and uh, these are exactly as they were published on your enrollment site. And we're going to start off by taking a look at understanding what business is all about. Obviously, we could spend many hours doing that. We're going to spend just a little piece of time giving you some thoughts as to how you might understand the business prior to any implementation of any management system. We're going to have a look at the origins of management systems, where they come from, how they work, and give you some, I hope you'll find, very useful tools to help you remember how to use them well. And as my colleague Susanna was just saying, our third objective is to have a good look at the structure of ISO 45001. Of course, let me remind you, the structure is still in draft. I'll be using the very latest information we have on the evolution of that standard, as well as giving you some predictions as to when you're likely to see it. And finally, towards the end of the session, I'd like to share with you, and it will be quite briefly, learning from a couple of case studies that I've been involved in uh, to give you the opportunity to see the sorts of benefits you and your organization might get from implementing such a standard. So we said we'd take a look at the essence of business and the essence of enterprise and what they're all like. I suppose most organizations that are big today started off small once when some entrepreneurs may well have got together with a great idea which gets developed. They go to the bank or they go to a stock market. If it's smaller, perhaps they go to friends or their parents and find the money that they need to purchase their assets to recruit the staff. And it's at this point that their big plan for the business starts to sort out. Over here on the right side of the screen, I've given some examples of the sorts of objectives that people at the start of businesses commonly have. Of course, they revise year on year on year on year. And the mission, the direction that the organization is heading in, and you see some of the examples um, of the types of things that people say here. Uh, you'll see at the bottom the whole idea of being incident free. And uh, of course, over time, the organization will develop. It will get more and more uh, aligned to its objectives. And a really good question is, what is it that gets organizations from the left here over to the right? I ask you to put into your mind, do you believe that every organization is equally successful? I guess like me, you've put a company into your mind, maybe you've read about it in the newspaper. You can do that almost any day in the world these days where something has gone wrong. The thing it seems to me that makes it the most likely that organizations will be successful in the transition from their good ideas to achieving their objectives is the use of structure in their means of control. And of course, we use all sorts of different structures. Again, I've given some examples. If you're involved in quality, you may well have heard of ISO 9001. If you're involved in finance, you might well have heard of the Companies Act 
that gives a structure, a legal structure in your territory. Of course, we've got our health and safety standards. And of course, there are lots of others for things like IT and security, environmental management. Uh, these have got to work at normal times, also when it's an abnormal period of business, and also at times of emergency, all underpinned by company policies and procedures. And over time, organizations tend to drive themselves towards continual improvement. And the view I take is all of this is for the benefit of five very particular uh, groups of people. Take a look at the first ones here. These are the investors. And whether this is friends or parents, whether it's the bank, or whether it's the, uh, the people who've come to a stock market looking for a, an asset to invest in, at some point they're going to want their money back. The investors are a very important part of the reasons that organizations must be successful. Of course, then we've got the employees. Employees very keen to keep their jobs, to have job security, salary increases, and all the benefits of working for an organization that is successful and achieving its objectives. Of course, we have other people working in the organization. They could be contractors. They could be suppliers. And all of those know that uh, if they're working with a successful organization, well, they too will share in the success too. I think it's reasonable to say that they share the fate of your organization. A fourth group, you'll see them, are the customers of the organization. Of course, they want things like delivery on time at a reasonable price, at a good standard of quality that they can tick the excellent box to time and time again, and satisfied customers are, of course, much more likely to recommend you to others. That's another means by which organizations grow. And in the global society, the global village in which we all live, where news travels so fast, society too has great expectations for organizations, whether it's the creation of jobs or whether it's payment for taxes to pay for health service, security and defense, and so on. So I, on my travels around the world, and I, I've worked in consulting for over 30 years, um, I hear many people talk about zero incidents. Here's a map of our fabulous planet in, in a way that suggests that zero incidents might be the reality. Of course, what we see when we open the newspaper, what we turn on the news, is bangs and explosions and leakage and losses and all sorts of things that can go terribly wrong. Time prohibits us from looking at each of these on the screen. Uh, we do record these webinars. If you'd like to take a look at any of these again later on, the color coding here says that anything that's black is probably a business financial issue. Uh, the ones that are color coded in green, they are the ones that are largely environmental related corporate disasters. And then the ones that are in red, either fully or partially in red, are ones where occupational health and safety uh, has been the impact. Uh, but many of these are things that I call black swans. And we'll come to black swans. These are the things that uh, are very, very unlikely, but are very serious when they occur. We'll have a look at that category of risk in just a moment or two. Now, we're going to move on now to our next objective, to have a look at the origins of management systems. Uh, they go back a long way, something of the order of 2,500 years. We go back to the Zhou dynasty of ancient China, where there was a very successful warrior. Uh, you'll see his name at the top, Sun Tzu, or General Sun Tzu. China was growing a lot at this time. And Sun Tzu seemed to be so much more successful on the battlefield than other people. And uh, only as recently, early as 1901, have we discovered just why Sun Tzu was so successful. In 1901, we found a script of a book 
alleged to have been written by Sun Tzu. It's called The Art of War. Um, it's probably the third most well-read book in the world today. Only the Holy Bible and the Holy Quran stand above this in terms of the number of readers. And it's been read by many military strategists and members of government and so on. And even our friend down here seems to have found it to be an interesting read. The book is all about how to win the war, how to plan for success. For example, it would not be wise to walk your troops onto the battlefield without knowing the size and strength of the enemy, a battle plan, a means by which the war is to be conducted, a means by which uh, you can move the troops, influence their behavior, whether they're advancing, holding the ground or retreating during the battle and then learning after the battle. A management system for success in warfare, it goes back 2,500 years. And if we bring the evolution of management systems a little more up to date, we come to meet somebody called Dr. Deming. William Edwards Deming, born in Sioux City, Iowa. There it is on the map in the United States of America in the year 1900. Um, a very bright kid, went to school, went to uh, university afterwards, uh, graduated in statistics and found himself working for the US government. There was a very significant event in 1945 uh, in the country of Japan. It ended the Second World War. And Deming found himself uh, in 1946 in Japan on behalf of the American government, finding out how, when uh, Japanese industrialism would develop once again. And uh, what he noted in Japan was a very different approach to what he'd seen in his own country. He noticed a great, ten a great tendency to planning activities and when those activities were to be carried out, well, they were implemented exactly in accordance with the plan. During the implementation of the plan, there would be all manner of checking taking on. Deming notes in his famous book, Out of the Crisis, I recommend that as a read if you're interested in this evolution that we're discussing. Um, Ten years after this, Deming writes out of the crisis and he says that specialist checkers, instead of taking the checking data away to their departments and sorting it and filing it, the checking data, how well things were being done, was used by management to influence progress in the future. And it is in the book, Out of the Crisis, that this cycle, this circle that you see here, is published for the very first time, very much known as the Deming Cycle. Some people call it the Deming Wheel. Plan, do, check, and then act. And you'll see that cycle, how it turns round and round and round. We'll simplify that. You'll see it on the screen here. The four elements that are the dynamics, really, of any management system that you might be using Right now, I've got two or three examples I'd like to share with you just to prove how this simple model of PDCA can be used to understand any management system. And uh, there's Deming at the bottom there, no longer with us. If I have any regrets, it's that I didn't get the chance to meet him. Um, our working lifetimes were just separated by, I think, too many years. Let's make this proof here. Uh, the current standard, and some of you might well be using this, or if not using it, you may be familiar with it, is OHSAS 18001 of 2007. It's owned by some certification bodies, and many people regard it as uh, the world's most common current occupational health and safety management system. It's got a number of sections in it. I've picked out the five main headline sections. Usually somebody asks, uh, where is section 4.1? The truth is there is a section 4.1, but 
but it just describes the general requirements. There is nothing particular that needs to be implemented. Let's take a look at each of these clauses in turn. Uh, in section 4.2, we have the requirement for there to be an occupational health and safety policy, a leadership standard that sets out the requirements that top management has for the rest of the organization, typically be signed by a member of top management within the last year or two. Section point three deals with the detailed planning for the implementation of the management system. Uh, it's a risk-based planning, so we'll be looking extremely briefly at risk assessment later on. Our future seminar series, our webinar series will include sessions on risk assessment and if you're interested in them I would encourage you to come along. Following section 4.3 we have our section 4.4 and here we have a look at the implementation and the operation of those detailed plans. In there, we're going to have the training of the staff uh, right the way through, the communication, all the way through operational control, and finishing with the implementation, when required, of the emergency plan. Section 4.5 deals with checking, and the final section of 4.6 leads to the review by senior management. And you'll see some color coding here. What you see in the green is what Dr. Deming would see as the plan. The black text illustrates the do. The red text illustrates the check. And finally, we have our management review. That uh, is where management takes a look at what we've learned on our journey so far, picks out the areas where improvement is needed, and uses them to drive future policy and future planning, and so the cycle continues. I've picked out a couple of similar standards that some people may be familiar with. Uh, the OGP is um, the International Oil and Gas Producers Group. Some years ago, they produced the HSE management system for the 40 members of this group. And as you take a look around that circle, we don't have time to go through every section, uh, but what I hope you'll see very quickly is the planning elements. Uh, you'll see the doing elements. Uh, you'll see there the implementation, the monitoring or the checking, and the review that leads to continual improvement in the future. This is the final example for now of uh, a common management system that some people may be familiar with. Uh, ILO is the International Labour Organization, uh, an executive agency of the United Nations. That's uh, all of your countries and, and, and my country too. And uh, generally speaking, the 2001 OSH standard is a cycle that looks like this, that starts with policy organizing and planning, takes us to implementation or the do, the evaluation or check, and the action that drives continual improvement. So that's been our journey from 2,500 years ago until about April 2012. And in April 2012, something quite significant happened. Um, I, I do come across quite a lot of practitioners that haven't heard about this, so uh, don't feel bad if you haven't. You would probably be in the, my, in the majority. Uh, in April 2012, a new standard was published by the International Standards Organization. It's commonly called Annex SL, and it provides a high-level framework for all management system standards owned by ISO from their next revision. So some of you may know ISO 9001, the quality standard, has already been revised to align to Annex SL. If we have anyone in our audience today that's interested in environmental management systems, ISO 14001 may sound familiar. And uh, just a year or so ago, September 2015, 
that too was reissued aligned to the 10 clauses of Annex SL. And uh, very much uh, ISO 45001 standard, the one that we're waiting for right now, when it's published, is going to align very closely to these high-level framework standards. So the ones in black are the ones that I would encourage you to worry less about. Uh, I would encourage you to think very closely about 4 through 10. And uh, the bright people listening here may well say, well, this looks a lot like a Deming wheel. It absolutely is a lot like the Deming wheel. But before we try and uh, interspace these sections into a picture that will help you remember it, let's just take a look at the timeline of what's going to happen, or so we think. So the absolute published intention of 45001 is to replace OHSAS 18001. So when one arrives, the other will disappear, and uh, I have no doubt that will happen. Uh, the committee that's leading the development, you'll see it noted at the top, ISO PC283. Uh, these discussions for the development have been going on since October 2013. And then you'll see the timeline rolling down the page. The first committee draft and its date, the draft international standard published February 2015. That was a consultation. There were 2,400 comments sent into PC283 for their deliberation. Um, those comments uh, were discussed at a meeting in Barbados, lovely place, and it resulted in the first draft international standard of January 2016. Um, the ballot closed on the 12th of May. 2016 and you know it was so close to being adopted 71% uh, voted for the standard 28% voted against there was a 1% abstention rate uh, the requirements for that standard to have been passed were that two-thirds should be in favor and well it cleared that hurdle uh, but also there should be no more than one quarter against and there were 28 percent against so incredibly close we nearly had our standard then but uh, as it did not achieve sufficient support there is a redrafting going on now so that started in Canada uh, it moved on to Lithuania uh, the next meeting of PC 283 is going to be in Austria between the 6th and the 10th of February and uh, members of that committee and I'm really very close to that um, we're expecting a further draft in June 2017 then there'll be another vote uh, the same rules apply two-thirds in favor and no more than one quarter against and uh, well we hope that that will result in agreement uh, probably no earlier than October of next year, October 2017, um, but I wouldn't put the house on that. It's possible, um, I've heard this from a couple of the committee members, say that it could be early 2018 before it arrives. So now we're going to make some predictions. Here is Stephen Asprey's prediction for what ISO 45001 will look like. So the words you'll see in here, might look very common, uh, very familiar. They come directly from Annex SL. We're going to have our planning elements of leadership and detailed planning. So some familiar things will be in there. Mm. Section 5.2 will be the occupational health and safety policy. 5.3 will be for roles and responsibilities to be set out. Section 6.1, I, I suspect, we're going to have our hazard identification and risk assessment that gives us our plan for the priorities. Moving around to the right-hand side, the do, we're going to have to do some training of our staff. I suspect that'll be 7.2. And then in 8.1, we're going to have our control 
processes, the hierarchy of control, manage of, management of contractors, outsourcing, procurement, we'll have our contractors in there too, and also the emergency preparedness and response. In section nine, the performance evaluation, we're going to have all the monitoring, so the active and reactive monitoring and the audit will live in there, and then in section 10, well, that's where we'll have our incident reporting, and uh, when we take all that information, dial it round in a circle, this is the tool that gives us our continual improvement. We set the scene at the start of this section. I was talking about what the business is trying to achieve. I was setting the scene for this new word called context. And context means a good understanding of the external environment in which the organization is working politically, economically, socially, and technically, as well as the organization's internal characteristics, strengths, its weaknesses, its opportunities, and any threats in there. And I'm going to define what we mean by a management system. It's got four elements of control. Uh, the first part here is that we've learned over our industrial history that the best means of getting from the start to the objectives are with a structured means. Does that guarantee zero incidents? I would argue not, but it gives us a reasonable assurance. And of course, it's each company, your company is listening to this webinar to decide how much assurance you need. If we have a structured means, we will meet our objectives. And the final part you'll see is to satisfy the responsibilities to all five groups of their stakeholders, not just the employees, not just the contractors, not just the investors, not just the customers, but all of them as well as meeting the expectations to society. I'm going to have a look very, very briefly at that black swan phrase that I used earlier on. These are increasingly in the world a characteristic of some of the losses we see. Um, do come on our risk assessment webinar uh, if you'd like to know more about this. But anyone that's done risk assessments before knows that we measure the likelihood of things occurring from great likelihood to very low likelihood as well as measuring the severity from very unlikely to very likely. And when we put those two things together, things that are unlikely and should they occur would be of low severity, we tend to call those low risk. Uh, whereas things that seem more likely and where the outcome would be unpleasant, either financially or in terms of a safety outcome or an environmental outcome, or a health outcome where they're more serious, we tend to call those the high risks. And these are the ones that would normally feature in the business planning. Now, here's the black swan. You'll see it sits in a different place of the matrix to where many people have thought about risk over the years. These are the things that can seriously hurt companies. In many companies, the belief is because they're so unlikely, they, well, they sort of manage themselves. But my picture of the world earlier on suggests that black swan risks should also be managed with a structured means of control. Now, where we have an area of risk, the black swan area and the higher, some of the medium risks too probably, we do get four choices as to how to reduce, how to attend to these risks. So here's the first choice. If you don't like the risk, stop doing it. Terminate the activity. Uh, I think also a case here for new projects might be to not even start them if you are unhappy with the level of risk involved. Then we have the second choice here, and that's to treat the risk. Uh, you'll see here in my little green bubble, how do we treat a risk? Well, if it's an occupational health and safety risk, 
Uh, my advice to you would be to use a recognized structured means of control and you'll see four to ten the clauses of Annex SL which will be the clauses of ISO 45001 which we're going to see in the next year or so. There are some other choices. Uh, our third choice is to try and transfer the risk to somebody else. Um, examples of this might be to have a joint venture with someone in the territory who knows more about the business environment there than you do. Also the classic risk transfer is to insurance. Transferring an unknown risk for a very known fixed premium. And then the final category is to tolerate, to take, to accept in a knowing way the risk and in many organizations it is true that the higher level of risk is referred to senior levels of management for greater approval. Terminate, treat, transfer and tolerate the four approaches to risk reduction and risk control. We call those the four T's. I think the final thing I'd like to talk with you about this afternoon is where audit fits in to all of this. Now we'll have a future seminar, uh, a webinar covering audit. Again, if you find the subject of audit interesting, I would absolutely encourage you to sign up to enroll for our session on auditing. Uh, what we have, of course, is a management team, I trust, committed to achieving its published objectives. And what management believes is that an occupational health and safety management system will help it to be successful in that regard. It's truly a two-way street. Uh, a sensible management team will have auditors in an audit team that come and take an independent look at the operation of that management system from time to time. Uh, the number of auditors will depend on how much assurance the organization wants. The number of days that this audit team will be looking at the operation of the management system likewise will depend upon the amount of assurance that management uh, needs. And the output from the audit team will be a report that points out to management a level of assurance. We use this little uh, reminder of the role of audit. I is to remind us that it should be independent. I think auditing your best friend is a very difficult thing to do. Uh, auditing someone whose department you'd like to work for next or auditing your boss is very difficult to be able to independently tell the truth what you find. W is well balanced. It means we don't just want more training, more manuals, more procedures, more drills. The amount of control should be proportionate to the amount of risk. Uh, the international community calls this a LARP, as low as reasonably practicable. And the A is to remind us that auditors should provide work that is appropriate to the needs of the organization. Again, audit is part of the continual improvement drive in organizations. And I'd like to share with you, as I said at the start, as you may have seen in the session objectives, a couple of case studies that illustrate this improvement opportunity. So in our first case study, we're going to look at a big international organization. They have something of the order of 60,000 employees around the world, and they have operations in 96 countries. With just a couple of countries in the world, a couple of hundred countries in the world, well, these people are almost everywhere. They're bound to have an operation near you. And in the second case study, we're going to have a look at a Middle Eastern uh, oil and gas producer that becomes the IOGP, the International Oil and Gas Producers, number one performer in health and safety terms. So let's take a look at the characteristics of our first company. Uh, they were established a long time ago, you'll see here, uh, way, way back in 1844, um, for a very long time, you know, way over 150 years. 
their operations uh, were left to local management to determine. 96 countries, there were 96 different occupational health and safety management systems. Uh, at the strong end, they had some 18,001 management systems implemented informally, and in some of these territories, they had absolutely nothing. Um, 60,000 staff, about 2 million people from the public are also on the premises of this big organization every day, and for over 150 years, the organization pretty much had no data until there was an occasional fatality or an occasional serious road traffic incident or an occasional major fire, and then everybody heard about what had happened. And the organization decided there was a change of leadership, some change in ownership, and they decided to do things a little differently. As you can see, they are appointed a senior vice president to lead global safety approaches. They created uh, a group occupational health and safety management system standard aligned to our standard here, 18,001. Uh, 38 specific standards that they required each of their operations around the world to follow, and six monthly self-assessments for each of those operations to advise top management what had and what had not been done, and uh, they absolutely used those self-assessments to target an audit program. So uh, they targeted the people at one end of the spectrum who looked perhaps too good to be true to be sure that they were indeed doing all the things that they said they were doing, and they also focused where the feedback was that uh, not much had been done, seeking to provide assistance and support. Uh, it took them about four and a half, almost five years to properly implement this management system here, uh, to the extent that by 2015, they won a ROSPA Bronze Award, in 2016, they won a ROSPA Silver Award for Occupational Health and Safety, and uh, I can tell you that right now that organization is using the journey towards gold as a global communication standard. Uh, the truth is, this is not just about winning awards. Uh, it has reduced in fewer serious accidents. It has reduced the number of minor accidents. The program has reduced the number of road traffic accidents and the performance, including reduced lost time from work, is now included in the PLC report to shareholders. I'd like to show you briefly what the safety world knows as the culture ladder. You know the idea of at the bottom, who cares as long as we're not caught? working towards ever higher standards of cultural awareness, right up to health and safety is how we do business around here. And that theoretical model for cultural improvement seems to me to be absolutely how this organization has used occupational health and safety management systems and structured means of control to drive that improvement. Now, I'm very conscious that we're at the 40-minute mark. We're a little longer than we said. I would like to just share with you some findings of our second case study, and then I will be very happy to take any questions either this afternoon. If we don't get round to your questions, I assure you we'll respond to them in writing in the next uh, few days. Case Study 2 is a much newer organization. It's in the energy sector was established 15 years ago, and it produces 36 million tons of uh, LNG per year. It's got some gas production lines. It produces a huge amount of the world's helium and ships it around the world to countries like yours and mine in a fleet of 27 uh, large vessels. Uh, there's 3,500 people involved, and I'd like to tell you their story of using occupational health and safety management systems. 
Their client, uh, our client's health and safety manager, attended our health and safety management systems class in Houston, Texas uh, in 2010. I was actually the tutor of the class. Uh, it was a five-day class. He came to see me on the fourth day. He said, Stephen, is it possible that you could bespoke this class to include our very specific procedures and systems? Uh, we did exactly that. We ran some pilot sessions in the early part of 2011. We made quite a lot of refinements in those sessions. And uh, ever since then, we've been running those classes for their workforce. Uh, you'll see we've run 45 sessions. Over a 1,000 people have attended those classes, almost a third of the total workforce. And uh, along that journey, it's a six-year journey, this client of ours has become one of the safest companies in the oil and gas sector in the world. It has world-class FAR, fatal accident rate. It has a world-class LTIR, the lost time injury rate. And it has world-class TRIR, the total recordable incident rate. Um, time doesn't really permit us to go into the fine details of everything showing on the chart here. I'm going to pick out just a few examples that you might wish to put your eyes upon. Um, and I also included a few photographs, and uh, if you look carefully, you might pick me out. I'm the guy in the top right-hand corner in the blue shirt, uh, leaning on that black wall. But these are some of the participants on the classes, an extremely international audience. Uh, I think the company has 58 nationalities working for it, and it's been an extremely positive program. So I'm going to conclude by thanking you for joining us. Uh, many of the things that I've talked about this afternoon you'll find in my five books, um, books one and book three, uh, reading from the left to the right, are my books about management systems for occupational health and safety and auditing. Uh, they're the ones that I would steer you towards if you wanted to read about them. Book two and book five are about corporate social responsibility. So a management systems approach Yes, to health and safety, but to all the other areas of corporate responsibility too. And then book four there with the egg timer on it is my book about dynamic risk assessment and its links to the other types of assessment. Once again, thank you for joining us. And I'm going to hand you back now to my colleague, Susanna. Uh, Mr. Asbury, thank you so much for this highly informative presentation. Uh, before we go to the Q&A session, I would like to inform you that PCB provides training and certification services uh, for occupational health and safety standards, such as OSAS 18001 and IS 45001. Uh, obtaining a PCB certification for these standards uh, proves your commitment to health and safety and your focus on employees' well-being. Uh, a PCB certificate will demonstrate your dedication in implementing and managing these processes and frameworks, and most importantly, you will be recognized worldwide. Uh, for more information, please visit our website, pcb.com slash training. We will go ahead and take time uh, to answer some questions. And the first question is, uh, can you tell us a specific reason why ISO 45001 is being delayed? There are a number of reasons, and if I'm honest with you, I would characterize them as relatively minor. Uh, I'll give you one example. Um, some, some, some members of uh, the committee uh, are concerned about the degree to which the new standard will compel, encourage employers to consult with their workers, and they are looking for a stronger set of words um, away from encourage and towards mandatory consultation with the workers. Um, and I suspect when we see the new standard, um, uh, June I think that will be next year, I think we possibly will see stronger commitment to managers 
implementing this management system with and through their employees rather than the management system being something that's done to them. Um, I think many people are frustrated and if, if I'm quite honest with you, um, whatever this standard is when it emerges, it is unlikely to be perfect forever. The standard itself will be subject to a continual improvement and I imagine in five, six, perhaps seven years, that seems to be about the improvement timeline, there will be a revision to the standard once again. So my personal view, and I should absolutely say this is my personal view, is there is very little reason why we could not have implemented this standard right now. And as I mentioned earlier, um, 70 1% of those voting uh, agreed with me. Thank you, Mr. Stephen. Uh, the next question is, uh, since there will be no major changes in the new standard, should my company get certified? Certification, firstly, will only be possible from the launch of the standard. Um, I mean, there are lots of international certification organizations in the world, of course, including BECB. Um, most international certification bodies require the management system to be implemented and working for at least three months. So I would not expect any organization in the world to be certified before spring or summer of 2018. Uh, even using the most optimistic timeline of October or November of 2017 for publication of the standard, add three months to that, that's going to be spring of 2018 at the very best. Certainly, you can get a copy of the draft 45001 standard. You can get that from your national standards body. Uh, you can also contact our organization, PECB, and we'll be pleased to share with you a briefing note on it. And my advice to an enthusiastic management would be to start thinking about what needs to be done. We certainly don't need to wait until the publication of the final standard. My prediction is the changes will be, as I said, relatively minor. Remember, we are constrained by the Annex SL framework, so the new standard will look very much like the draft, in my judgment. The changes will be relatively minor in nature. Thank you. Uh, the next question is, why did uh, the ISO decide to create a new standard on occupational health and safety? Well, <laughs> I think there's a number of reasons for that. Um, there will certainly be external reasons. Um, certainly, um, there seems to be a large demand for international standards these days. Uh, I think the growth of ISO 9001 uh, has proven that. Uh, likewise, the growth over the last 10 years or so of ISO 14001 has proven that there is a demand for standards such as this one. And ISO is a commercial organization. I imagine many of the people uh, listening to our webinar today, you know, might make uh, sausages or motor cars or they might generate electricity or chemicals or deliver the mail. I really don't know. But ISO is in the business of selling its standards. And I think it sees there is a great opportunity. So the market's calling for it. And internally, I think ISE, ISO sees the commercial opportunity to develop this standard too. Thank you. Uh, we have a really interesting question. Uh, it says, a lot of my clients in the United States feel that their OSHA VPP program is a superior standard to OSIS 18001 and ISO 45001. Uh, they feel that this is enough. How should we convince clients that ISO 45001 is the way to go when they feel so strongly about their own standard being superior? Well, it's an extremely interesting question, Susanna, and uh, 
thank you particularly for that question. Thank you for all of them. Um, there are two approaches, some argue. I, I think I might be one of them to achieving good standards of worker protection. Um, in the United States, the VPP programs and, and OSHA generally provide a set of very prescriptive standards for organizations to achieve. Um, now, on, on the basis that the standards are written well, this can deliver good standards of worker protection and um, the alternative to that is what some people might call a more European approach, which is a risk-based approach. So it's not a prescriptive standard. It is for the organization then to determine which are the most significant risks and to implement the controls that they feel are the most appropriate. Now, please don't anybody think that uh, the ISO standard says that you don't have to follow the law. Absolutely you do. Um, it is very likely that in section 6.1 there will be a mandatory requirement to identify the legal requirements. Uh, it's actually nothing new. It's, it's one of the standard clauses in the current OHSAS 18001 standard. So if we come back to the top of the hill and take a look at the big picture, um, it is obviously for the senior management of an organization to make sure that legal compliance is being achieved, either under an OSHA regulation or under any other regulatory framework. It is also for the senior management of the organization to determine whether or not a cycle of continual improvement, learning and implementing, being predictive and preventing um, is for that organization. It is a, ultimately a management decision and however enthusiastic I may be about management systems, I, I really have seen their success for 30 years and I've given you a couple of examples the, uh, in this webinar of how that's worked for other organizations, um, is a decision for senior management to take. I think my final comment here is legal standards, certainly in my experience, set the minimum standard. The organizations that seem to have performed the best over the last 20 or 30 years have not been satisfied with the minimum standards they've pushed forwards into other areas of compliance, including those that are non-regulated. Mr. Asbury, thank you once again for your presentation. It was our honor having you as a presenter. I would also like to thank all the attendees for joining us. Uh, unfortunately, we are out of time and all of the received questions will be answered personally by Mr. Asbury via email. On behalf of PCB and our presenter, we wish you a great weekend. Bye.